Hello and welcome to Stay for Dinner, a podcast of cooking, curiosity, and conversation. My name is DC Pearson. I'm an author, a comedian, and an enthusiastic home cook. Uh, and today, my guest at this tiny dinner party that's also a podcast will be Kate Spencer. Kate is the author of the memoir Dead Moms Club. She is the host of the very recently iHeartRadio podcast, award-winning podcast Forever 35. It's like an amazing podcast about self-care and beauty stuff. And it's, it, I don't even relate to a lot of the immediate subject matter of the podcast, but if you've ever listened to it, it's just incredibly chill. Um, I highly recommend it, even if, if you're not in, super into beauty stuff. It just is like a good, like, uh, uh, just like a nice back scratch for your brain. Uh, it's awesome. Um, and I'm super excited to have Kate over today, and we are going to be having fried rice. Um, I love making fried rice. I've made it a bunch of times. It's not so much a recipe as it is a method. And my method is inspired by uh, this book called 101 Easy Asian Recipes that David Chang's late lamented food magazine Lucky Peach put out. The book was written by Peter Meehan, now food editor of the LA Times. And I, I love the book. I love it so much. And the best thing that it did for me was get me into the method of cooking fried rice. And Peter basically breaks it down into uh, categories of stuff and sauce. Every fried rice that you make is gonna have stuff and sauce. Um, but other than that, you can really kind of freestyle. So I'm gonna be doing a fairly traditional one, but the great thing about fried rice is that you really can utilize just like every single leftover in your <laughs> in your uh, fridge if you want to and that's what we often do around here today i won't be going quite that far but i will be utilizing a little old sweet potato that's been hanging out uh kind of all of its other friends have been eaten and today is the day that it finally graduates into people's stomachs um quick check of my ingredients here i have two eggs. I'm going to be using about four ounces of ground pork. Um, and for my, uh, let's see, for my stuff, I'm going to be utilizing that little sweet potato we talked about. And then maybe like about like half a cup of uh, peas. Um, a couple of uh, scallions are going to be utilized as well. A couple of green onions. Um, and then for my sauce, I'm going to be using a, t a tablespoon of soy sauce, a tablespoon of fish sauce, uh, like a teaspoon or so, uh, or like a teaspoon or so of uh, table sugar, and then I'm also going to be throwing in a little bit of Shaoxing cooking wine, um, which is a really awesome ingredient that I highly recommend. It adds just a very nice acidity and a little bit of that sort of like you know like why we like cooking with any kind of alcohol because it just adds a little bit of that nice acid and has a real sort of like. I can't even put it into words, just a very Chinese food taste to it to be completely reductive. Um, and so I'm gonna be using a little bit of that in the sauce as well, um, maybe like a tablespoon of that. And then rice-wise, you're gonna be using about three cups of cooked rice. Um, obviously, preferably if you have like day-old leftover rice, that is the sort of Cadillac of fried rice rices, like maybe from some Chinese takeout or something. But in my case, I'm just going to be making about a cup of dry Calrose rice that's going to yield me eh, about that much. So just uh, if you're going from dry rice, just basically cooking according to package directions. Basically, the trick that I learned from the night market cookbook is that if you you know, want to make fried rice, but you don't have leftover rice, you can make um, rice with just a little less water than you would normally use. Like in this case, I'm using almost a one to one ratio. I'm doing about a cup of Calrose rice and then a little more than a cup of water. And that hopefully will result in the kind of more dried style rice that we like for fried rice. It has that starchiness that we're looking for. Add a little salt. Turn the heat up to high and then watch it because when it boils, we are going to cover it and then let it cook for 20 minutes and then we're going to let it rest for 10 minutes. All right, so my rice is coming up to a boil and then I'm going to whack it down to low heat. 
cover the pot and let it cook for 20 minutes. So let's go ahead and get into measing our ingredients. Um, I'm gonna start off with my aromatics, my ginger and garlic. I have just like a little knob of ginger, like about like a one inch knob, uh, yeah. And I'm gonna be doing a trick that I really like for peeling ginger, which is you just take a normal like spoon and you just kind of peel it using the edge of the spoon. And it works really well because ginger um, has all of these weird little knobby, gnarly parts, like it's an old tree in a magical kingdom that has a lot of wisdom to impart. And uh, a spoon really helps you strip all the bark off of that old, very fragrant wise tree. Cool, now that I've peeled my ginger, I'm going to dice it up. And fried rice is really the kind of thing where you want in your little cooking <laughs> cockpit when you're at the stove, um, you want your ingredients right there, prepped, ready to go, because once you get it on the stove, it's pretty fast. So I'm gonna put my ginger in the same bowl as I'm gonna put the garlic that I'm about to dice up. I'm gonna dice up about one to two, actually more like two to four cloves of garlic. I think I'm gonna do three in this case. All right, I have uh, diced up my garlic and put that in the bowl with the ginger. And then finally for my aromatics, I am going to be cutting up two scallions. I'm gonna be separating the bottom white parts from the top green parts. And then I'm gonna be giving the bottom white and light green parts a pretty good little mince. So they're kind of the same size as my garlic and my ginger. And then while we're in scallion town, I'm gonna to be slicing the green parts of the scallions on an angle. And we're actually gonna use these for garnish at the end. These are not gonna go in with the rest of our aromatics. Scallions do this annoying thing where if you don't really <laughs> cut the crap out of them, they kind of stick together a little bit. That really annoys me. It shouldn't, but it does. So I'm gonna put my little green parts of the scallions for garnish in a bowl. And then I'm gonna put those in the area where I'm ultimately gonna plate my dish. And then now that I have my aromatics, my garlic, my ginger, my bottom parts of the scallions, I'm gonna set that next to the stove where the action is or will be. Um, and then I'm going to move into my stuff category. This is all the stuff that gets thrown in that you can kind of really freestyle with and sort of do what you want. In this case, like I said, I'm doing sweet potato. Uh, that's kind of gonna be like the carrots in a traditional fried rice and it looks the same, it's very pleasing and I don't have carrots and I do have a sweet potato. Uh, and a little bit of peas and a little bit of ground pork. The meat is not really the star of this dish. It's kind of just, you know, a flavoring. So first I'm gonna peel my sweet potato. And then I'm gonna give it a Tight little dice, like little cubes, basically. Okay, got my sweet potatoes all diced up. Gonna put that in the bowl that my peas and my pork are also gonna be placed into right now. So about half a cup of peas. I'm using fresh peas. You could totally use frozen peas as well. All right, I'm gonna place my bowl with my stuff next to the oven as well. I always use oven and stove interchangeably and I really don't mean to. They're super not the same thing. It's just that, you know, they're, uh, they're part of each other in most places. All right, now I'm gonna crack two eggs into a bowl and scramble them just a little bit or, you know, stir them around. What's the word I'm looking for? Whisk, that's the word. I'm not gonna use a whisk though, I'm just gonna use a fork. And I'm gonna throw a little pinch of salt in my, my uh, whisked <laughs> eggs as well. Just a little bit. I mean, overall, we're gonna have a lot of salt in the sauce, so no need to overdo it, but just so we know there's some seasoning in that ingredient. And then finally, I am going to make my sauce by combining one tablespoon of soy sauce. You could really just do two tablespoons, you could do one, one and a half, it's really a matter of taste. 
Um, about one tablespoon of fish sauce. I just really like the umami of it. I saw today at Trader Joe's they now have Red Boat fish sauce, which is awesome. It's such a good Vietnamese fish sauce. It is deep and funky and everything. That's great about fish sauce. So and then a little cooking wine, the Shaojin cooking wine. You could probably also use like rice wine vinegar or you know anything else to kind of give it that acidity. And then a teaspoon of sugar. I feel like a good rule of thumb for fried rice sauces is you want the saltiness, probably from soy sauce or fish sauce. And then you want a little bit of sweetness, like a teaspoon of sugar will get you there. Um, and then probably some heat, maybe a little bit, or some acidity. Uh, and you can kind of just sort of freestyle it to, honestly, very much to your taste. And now that my rice has finished cooking, I'm going to put that on the back burner. And I'm going to grab my wok. You can also use a skillet or, you know, a big flat pan, whatever you have. But I have a wok, so I'm going to use it. And I love it. I love stir frying in a wok. You don't have to spend a lot of money on it. It's going to end up getting all gnarly and cool and seasoned anyway. So first things first, I am going to put a little bit of neutral oil, like in this case, canola oil in the bottom of my wok. And first thing, and this is a uh, definitely a method that I'm gleaning from 101 Easy Asian Recipes. Um, we're going to cook the eggs first. So I'm gonna put like a tablespoon, two tablespoons or so of oil in the bottom of my wok. And once I feel like my oil is hot, I am going to put in my eggs for just a minute, just so they're cooked. They're gonna cook super fast in this oil. So I'm gonna take a spatula. In this case, I have a wok spatula that I really like. And I'm going to kind of turn my eggs over each other, just get them moving and cooking. Then I'm gonna grab myself a plate and put the eggs onto said plate just to set aside. We'll see them again in a minute. And then still got some nice hot oil at the bottom of my wok. That's good. If your wok is looking dry, you might want to add a little bit more oil, get it hot. And then we are going to first throw in our aromatics. In this case, our garlic, our ginger, and our white bottoms of scallions. And we're just going to stir fry these for like 30 seconds to a minute. And it's going to smell amazing almost immediately. <laughs> Definitely does in this case. And we're infusing the oil with all of these awesome flavors. Then we're gonna add our stuff. So I just tipped in my ground pork, my diced sweet potato, and my peas. And if you have ground meat, it's good to kind of like chop it up a little bit so that it can be evenly distributed through your dish. And again, we're stir frying on a pretty dang high heat. And we just want to make sure everything's cooked. If you want meat, you want to make sure that's cooked. Seafood, cooked. You can really put pretty much whatever you want in here. I was reading online that a lot of, on the fried rice Wikipedia page, that a lot of vegetarian restaurants will, you know, ever since vegetarian restaurants have been a thing, you see fried rice a lot on the menu because it's a really kind of, fun, delicious, kind of almost dinery food that you really don't need meat for. Definitely often like to have an egg in there or something, but you can just do tofu alone. You can do really whatever you want. It's the best. It's such a good way to use random vegetables that are lurking in the back of your fridge. Your mileage may vary depending on what kind of stuff you're using, but I've been cooking my sweet potato and pork and peas for about eh, three, four minutes here. I feel like they're pretty well cooked through. And then I am going to add in my rice. 
So if you're using leftover rice, you're definitely going to want to make sure that there's no big clumps or anything like that. You can kind of break it up with your hands. But in this case, I'm just tipping it right from the pot I cooked it in. And I see that it's decently dry. I maybe could have let it sit a little bit longer, but it was on a little bit of a time crunch. And that's the great thing about fried rice is it's fast. So we're going to go with it. So now that my rice is in the wok, I am going to kind of stir to mix everything in, get my rice all mixed in with my sauce and the our aromatic infused oil. Break up any big clumps of rice I might have. And then our sauce is about to come into play. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sort of flatten my rice down to the pan, kind of spread it out. Then I'm going to grab my sauce and pour it in a sort of evenly distributed way. Stir it around to get all the sauce in there. So I'm gonna do a process now where I pat the rice down, I let it cook, and then I stir it all up again and pat it down again. This is really, this is the moment where it's really kind of getting very fried rice-y. I don't know how else to put it exactly. So about a minute's gone by. Ooh, yeah, I got some nice browning on the bottom of my rice. And this is where a wok spatula really comes in because it's really good at kind of scraping any burn or, you know, brown parts off. And then now that I've stirred it all up, I'm going to pat it down again and get different parts cooking. And the phrase that I always think of from the 101 Easy Asian Recipes fried rice method is we're looking for the rice to get pleasantly dry, which I think is in and of itself a pleasant turn of phrase. That's why it stuck with me. All right, another minute's gone by. Gonna flip around, pat down again. Okay, my last round, we got a good amount of char. So, I'm gonna stir that around to incorporate, and by now, we are almost more than pleasantly dry. <laughs> so, final step here in the wok or the skillet or whatever, I'm going to throw in my cooked egg from before, and then I'm gonna kinda chop it up with my spatula or my wok spatula or even my wooden spoon, whatever tool you're using. And kind of, I mean, you've seen fried rice before. You know how the egg gets in there. Stir it around to incorporate. Okay, gonna turn my heat off. Quick taste to check for seasoning. Not bad, salt level's good. So now I'm gonna dish it into two bowls and top it with scallions. And we have fried rice, my friends. Oh, awesome. Okay. What's going on? You. you too. How's it going? Not too bad. Hey, Kate. Hi. So today we are having, as you have no doubt realized, because you're already eating and seeming to be enjoying. It's really good. <laughs> my mouth is having... full. Sorry. Um, I'm almost done. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> so Kate and I are going to eat this fried rice real quick so we don't make too many gross mouth sounds on mic. That's a separate feed that you have to subscribe to. It's an it's... ASMR podcast. Maybe. Gross mouth, gross mouth sounds. Gross mouth sounds. I'm I'm into it. It's just like a little bit of new agey like wind chimes underneath it. The soft, <laughs> soft little... Oh my gosh, I also have to ask you a question about Please. Did you get your rice at Trader Joe's and if so, did you buy the frozen rice? You know what? I did and it is Calrose rice, mm, which you can get in like, you know, the yeah, Calrose rice. It's good rice. Yeah, right? <laughs> The medium grain? Yes. Um, I really like it. Um, and it's super versatile. And you can just get a big sack of it and use it forever. So, Kate, first off, um, just immediate thoughts, impressions, reactions to the fried rice that we just 
It was very good. I was doing a lot of comparing it to the fried rice that I make for my family often, like at least once every couple of weeks. Yours is better. I liked the, f- the flavor was richer. There was a ginger element that I really liked. Did you put ginger in it? I did. The Let's ginger- talk about your fried rice. I oh, want to hear about your fried rice. My fried rice is, I, I am in the position of having to try to make meals for a family of four including two children with different taste buds and taste buds that are still developing, let's say. So they can be, you know, picky. I don't like to like assign that term to them because I do feel like people who didn't eat a lot of food choices as kids, often their palates expand. You know, like I didn't eat tomatoes until I was 25-ish. So, (laughs) but I have to like accommodate a lot of you know, preferences. So like I couldn't put a scallion in my fried rice. Mm. I'm ginger might fly like tasting the ginger. I was like, Oh, I got to do that. I gotta, why don't I put ginger in my fried rice? The ginger was such a nice touch. And then also, as I mentioned to you, I really liked the crunchy char of the rice. Right. That partially, as we discussed off mic was a function of me finishing the dish two minutes after you arrived. So <laughs> when I came to greet you at the door, oh. it was still on the stove, which probably I should have turned it down. <laughs> but it, 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 I, I felt like it enhanced. Like I love getting um, a hot, like a, a hot rice dish and like a hot stone bowl and the rice fries on the bottom. So this had that element that I really, really enjoyed. Oh, nice. It was so very good. Out. I guess there's a lesson there in terms of the thing that you're like, oh, crap, sometimes can be... It tasted like an active choice to me. Oh, neat. Yeah, there definitely is like, I am doing a method where I'm trying to like, you know, flatten it to the wok Uh and then let it get a little brown and then stir it around and then pat it down again and kind of do that a few times until it's sort of where I want it to be. And what are you using? Do you use butter? I don't. Oh, okay. Okay. Just basically quick, quick rundown canola oil at the beginning okay and then i do the egg first Mm -hmm. and then get the egg out of there and then put in the aromatics like in this case garlic ginger the white parts of the scallions Mm. and then stir that around for like 30 seconds a minute and then put in in this case peas sweet potato and a little bit of ground pork oh there was sweet potato in there yeah because one of the reasons and i this is i bet this is similar to your experience as well one of the reasons i really like fried rice is it's you can just put like whatever in it sure. you know what i mean like you can it's a good fridge clearing you know yes. sort of and in this case i had just a random sweet potato hanging out that all the other sweet potatoes <laughs> <laughs> have since have since gone to, to the, that big yeah. sweet potato field in the sky. Yeah, that's where but they this go. this one was, you know, still hanging out. And so I was like, oh, I should get carrots for the fried rice. And then I was like, nope, I'm going to use the sweet potato. That so was I did. great. Oh, thank uh, you. And like, what a great way to just like get a, whatever nutrients a sweet potato provides. Some, you got beta carotene? Something, right? I don't even I know. I think of orange as being beta carotene. Maybe that's just because it has the word carrot in it. Let's is that possible? Let's say it is. <laughs> no, I think you're right. Well, carrots do have beta carotene. Do sweet potatoes? I don't know. I know they're good for you. Listeners, write in. Yeah. Nutritionists, <laughs> all the nutritionists out there listening to this to be mad. All the chefs. Oh my God, all of you. I this, Since this hasn't come out yet, I can't imagine a single person. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. And it's surreal. I have that experience with the podcast I do where like we just make a joke where it's like all the professors and then someone writes in and it's like, I'm a professor. And it's like (laughs) such an honor to be like, wow, you are listening to this. So you're going to have that over and over again. I bet you a chef and a nutritionist and maybe like a farmer. Well, listen, I, I swear. I just want all the members of the New Village people to listen to this. <laughs> that's the nutritionist, thing? the chef. No, oh, that's I right. This is like a, like the LA 2020 Village people. That's right. Yes. An a influencer. crystal store owner. Uh-huh. <laughs> An influencer. TikToker. And that's different than a TikTok and a influencer? I guess it is, right? I think it, I think it can be both. Right. You could be a TikTok-based influencer. I mean, I started getting deep on TikTok. I know that's or not what this you? podcast is about. Are you, do your kids like TikTok? They don't know what it is. I, they oh, don't know. Gotcha. Um, that's probably for the best. I think so. But the problem is I want to introduce them because I want us to all learn the dances together, like the popular TikTok sure. dances. So You might be able to introduce it to them in a way 
Like, do you know the movie Dog Tooth? No. Where it's like these, it's it's that dude, the guy that made The Favorite, it's his first movie. Oh. And it's about, it's very weird and kind of messed up. It's about okay. like a, basically a couple of siblings who are being raised in a house where they're never allowed outside and their parents are basically like constructing their reality for them. Oh God. Okay. So I think you can basically, I'm really trying to sell you on this. <laughs> That's what you're saying. You is. can do, <laughs> you can do that for your kids but yes. with TikTok and be like, you don't have to be like, this is from a thing where people put up videos. You can just be like, there's news from outside. This Let's new dance this is dance. coming. I yes, think you're exactly. like, I think actually you are totally right. And that is how I'm going to approach it. Or, <laughs> Or you and Anthony learn the dance, and then you just act like it's a dance that you guys came like, up oh, with. Like, oh, hey, we created this cool <laughs> dance to this. I don't even know who. I, like, Dua Lipa song. I mean, it's it's a weird, bizarro world. That sounds right. But I love it. Dua Lipa was one of the first people that I discovered first by being a, a musical guest on SNL. And it really was like oh, a passing really? of the torch where I was like, well, I don't know who the musical guest on SNL is now. That's how old I am. That's, Isn't that that's the, the weirdest? That that's a weird feeling, right? That, Absolutely. That musical guest SNL moment. Yes. When yeah. the SNL music booker becomes more on, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're you're, cooler than you. And I guess that's their job. That's and okay. actually it's interesting that you say that because you're someone I associate as like a music tastemaker. Um, that is sweet of you. I like to think that I am still somewhat, I guess, up on what's happening in music, but I feel like I'm really not. I feel like I've just kind of turned backwards and I'm sort of going through like, what old music do I like that I don't know about or whatever? Like yeah. I'm, I'm trying to stay up on like, what are new things that are happening? And I just got Spotify and that's kind of helping. But like it is, it does, I don't know, like I don't read like Pitchfork anymore. I yeah. used to be very sort of like trying to actively trying to stay sure. up on all this stuff and now it's a little bit more passive like if somebody on social media whom i like recommends something i'll be like i'll check that out but it's a little more of a slow drip than it used to be me actively seeking out the fire hose of what's happening yeah in music i think that's normal as we age i think you're right and so i just gotta like steer into it but i wanted to ask first off kate spencer yes where or second off i suppose mm-hmm. Where does cooking fit in or not fit in to your life? Right well, now? it's it's um, my relationship with cooking. I mean, this is gonna this has like many layers. Please. The first layer is that I started meal planning on a weekly basis last year. So my husband Anthony was out of town for on and off a whole year uh, because of wow. work. Right. So the way I kind of had to get a handle on things in terms of like me feeding myself and my two kids was meal planning. And I do it every Sunday and it started to become something I kind of enjoy doing. And I like, like, it's like a puzzle. Like I try to figure out what meals are going to be easy for me to make and everybody will eat. And like, oftentimes I don't solve that puzzle. (laughs) Oftentimes everyone hates the puzzle. (laughs) So that's one part of it. And, and so I do the bulk of the cooking, um, And I think that's just because now I'm kind of a control freak about it. My husband's a really good cook, but he's the kind of person who's like opens a fridge and is like, oh, we have three onions and chicken thighs. And then it's like sizzle, sizzle. And he's made like a delicious meal. Um, Whereas I have this like rigid thing of like, I like to know what I'm making every night. And it it just helps me kind of have a plan or the week of my kids activities, my work, my activities, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one part of my relationship to cooking. The other part has been in the past year or so really um, undoing the kind of painful layers of disordered eating that have wrapped their arms around me my whole life. And so that has been interesting just in terms of like letting myself cook things that I normally didn't let myself eat. And that started about like a year ago. Yeah. And was that was that the kind of thing that was led into? If you don't mind me asking, no, as, I'll, as much ta- as, I'll talk as about as you're comfortable I'll, saying. I'll talk about anything. Was that the kind of thing that was led into? Did you discover that through cooking, or was that kind of starting to bring up emotions that were kind of forcing you to confront that, or was it more of a sort of like I started talking about it in therapy, so now I'm? It was more like I was doing a lot of work on it in therapy. And I also started seeing a nutritionist to kind of work on it, what's called intuitive eating and. Um, I, ha- I, I just started my relationship with food changed and I started um, really examining like what kind of boundaries I had placed on myself with food because I had 
I had um, absorbed so much literature about different uh, food restraint, like the paleo diet or macrobiotic. Like I, I had almost absorbed so much that my brain was just this muddled place of contradictions. Whereas like you take the paleo way of eating and that, that just, they don't recommend eating beans. Whereas you take like a vegetarian diet, which I was a vegetarian for many years. And it's like beans are the greatest thing to ever live on the earth. So I was, I, I kind of reached a place where I was like, I don't even know how to eat because I'm so full of all this information combined with like feelings about myself. So the this thing that I, I cooked, um, Samin Nosrat, who's an amazing writer and cook and human, um, had a focaccia recipe mm. and it's the, if you've seen salt, fat, acid, heat, um, Samin's show on Netflix, she makes this, she makes focaccia in the first episode and I'm a quarter Italian and I, in terms of like my other relationship with food and cooking, that really resonates with me. Like I love cooking Italian food. I feel, I don't feel like a comfortable cook, but that's, I do feel comfortable making Italian food. So I made, and, but I'd never made bread. And so I made that focaccia and it was really like this weirdly healing experience like it was just it's so um tactile I think that's the word I'm looking for just like you're using your fingers to to mold out the bread and then you pour the olive oil in and it just felt really good and then it was delicious so good so easy anyone could do it and that was very like that was the moment where I made a food that I had restricted for myself for many years so that was kind of empowering and then it just was cool to make something that was delicious and I could feed my family. I made it for Christmas dinner. Oh man. So that was a real turning for a point for me oh, like a year and a half ago. That's so cool. I think, I don't know. I, I've never gotten into like making bread. I've made dough one time to make like fresh pasta, but that's, Ooh. I also feel like it, I don't know. That's really neat and it also feels like a very as you said like multi-layered thing where it's also like it's incorporating your like heritage and part of your family yeah. but you're also feeding your family and you're like carrying that forward and I do think I don't know it's so it's interesting you were talking about like all of the different food knowledge that we all absorb or who knows if it's even knowledge right i know that's These the like wrong systems. word yes it's, it is what, like i think you said something systems you said is like good almost like it's almost this, these sort of like religious doctrines because yes. nobody really wants to or nobody can i feel like get rich off a book where they're being like hey sort of kind of eat what you want <laughs> but i don't know different people are different and anyway give me millions of dollars yeah, everything's like, basically fine just like maybe a lot of vegetables and then whatever else you want. Right. Yeah, that's, th that's basically, I think, how we should do it. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, I guess that's kind of the Michael Pollan thing, and he yes, is rich, so yes. maybe you can do it. Maybe only one guy can do it, and he his name it. was Michael Pollan, Corner and he, he done did it already. <laughs> and so <laughs> nobody else it. can, can, can I mean, get rich on exactly that. But I do think there is something to like these different systems of eating where a lot of us, just about all of us, I think, on some level crave being told what to do yes and crave being told like this is the right thing to do and if you do this your mortality will extend for you know i think that's it's tied up in this there's like righteousness there's privilege there's um elements of like superiority and wanting to feel like we're the best i i, I mean I, I again i'm in i'm in therapy for all this right. stuff and more and more therapy is real fun um but i it it Un, un, like dismantling that for me is an ongoing process and revisiting food that I haven't like kind of ha had like demonized in my brain has been really empowering and what really were fun. Some, what were some other foods that you found yourself being like, this is something that I've uh, restricted myself from having for, for whatever reason. Oh, I mean, dairy is still one that I'm working on. Interesting. Like yogurt. I, I just, for some reason, got in my head of like, oh, dairy is a real problem food for people. You know, there's, a, there's all this kind of like health and wellness. Um, uh, what's like, I don't even know the right word I'm looking for. Like health and wellness. I don't know. Bull, not bullshit, but like the, <laughs> it, the connection that people try to make between what you eat and then your health. Right. Obviously, there are some like connections, but I think sometimes you know when it's taken to the extreme, is when I know for myself I went into really restrictive behavior patterns. So like yogurt, for some reason, that's a hard one I'm trying to like huh. get back into. But because you felt like that's 
bad for me? Uh, yeah. I got in my head about like dairy being bad or maybe, you know, it's not good for the body or it's, you know, again, someone might have a dairy allergy, which is very valid, but I right. don't have any food allergies. So it was, it was just me really interpreting a lot of diets and diet culture and then manifesting it in how I ate. Right. That's, that is, that's really interesting because right when you were saying that I was imagining again, a theoretical listener to this podcast or really anything like being like, well, it is actually really bad. And we're not, you know, we've all heard that yeah, person being of course. like, we're not supposed to have dairy and we're not supposed to whatever. And all of those things, it's like, I could believe that. Or like, I can understand some of what the underpinnings of, of that are. And that might be true. And different people have different, uh, obviously if you're a vegan, it's just sort of like, you're not totally. eating animal products for any reason. That's totally fine. But I also just think like one thing that sort of gets lost in a lot of food conversations let's just lay aside like truly actually eating meat for a second. I do think one thing that gets sort of lost is like things can be good for you in different ways. Mm, you know what I mean? That's such a nice way of putting it. I love that. Where It's just sort of like, yeah, I could be believe, especially as I, it's like, I think di people process dairy and other stuff in different ways, even as they get older or sometimes yeah. they, they couldn't process it and then they can or vice versa. And so it's just like, that just sort of is what it is. But I do think on a certain level, it's like you might decide, even if it, you don't process dairy that easily, that it's worth it to you because you just love cheese yeah. or you just mm. love, you know, eh, mostly cheese. Okay, uh, ice cream, <laughs> a really yes, good right. ice cream. Yeah. And I think like that's a, something that gets lost is that somebody might go, you know what? I understand that health wise, this might not be the most optimal thing for me at all times, but... I, it feeds me in other ways, basically. And I guess that's just where like the moderation thing comes in. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really beautiful way of putting it because I think so much of the focus on food, certainly kind of in, in American culture is on health. Right. Yes. And, uh, like I was just thinking of this beautiful rice that you made. Like I really, the ginger, I keep coming out of the ginger, but the flavor was just so pronounced and like, I just loved it. And I, every time I took a bite, I was like hoping to get a little ginger. And there's such a, a pleasure in that, you know, like your senses are being indulged in such a satisfying way. And that to me is such an important part of food. Like the, the way it makes you feel. It's nice to get to sit here and eat and talk to you, someone who I haven't seen in a long time. Like it's, there's so many other things that go along with food besides just whether or not it contributes to our health. Yes. And again, it's not to take away from the idea that food contributes no, to it. You know, and I, I, I feel like I always have to preface everything with right. a disclaimer, but I just think there can be such um, joy in food and eating. And that's something I'm really kind of learning about now as I move forward in my food journey and finding like recipes that, um, that make me that are joyful and fun and pleasurable to make and to eat. What, what are, I mean, for me, like I pasta brings me like such joy. I think it reminds me of my grandparents a little bit. I just, I love tomato sauce. I love the like nuances that go into a tomato sauce. I, I really cannot like the a canned tomato sauce. I just can't do. That's like the one thing I'm a little snobby about. Um, I haven't roasted my own tomatoes for a sauce, but I would like to get there. Doesn't that seem fun? It does. Like when you hear about sort of like, or you, you know, like uh, Italian American families or Italians or yes. whatever, sort of like having the week or weekend or whatever, where it's like, and then we just have all these tomatoes and we're just going to like, r like can all the sauce for the year. Yeah. Seems that just is incredible. It's intensely appealing to me. But what kind of memories come up for you when you think about like pasta and your grandparents? Like well, where do you go? I both my sets of grandparents each had gardens, huge gardens. Wow. So I had one set of grandparents, my mom's parents, who lived in a rural part of New Hampshire, who they had a lot of land and had a really beautiful vegetable garden. So every summer when or whenever I was visiting them, but in the summer we'd like go and pick stuff out of the garden and then like sit on the steps of their house and like, you know, break off the green bean tops and stuff like that and then we would eat it so there was that always with them and same with my dad's parents and my dad's parents grew up in a, in a kind of um like you know lower middle income suburban italian american community in connecticut tiny house tiny yard the whole yard was a garden like just and they they didn't compost they would just like take their food waste and eggshells and just like throw it on the garden like it was just you know they were they really grew the food because they liked to eat it and and grow it and so everything you ate there was from their garden and like I would leave with 
dried oregano that had come from their garden that my grandfather had made and dried or like they had tomatoes and the tomato seeds had come with my great grandfather from Italy. And I think someone still has that, a tomato plant growing from those seeds wow. somewhere in my family. My dad might. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So just stuff like it, just the, the food to the table, it was just like walking out to their backyard and just, you know, it, then it was right there and, and both my sets of grandparents. So that was really cool just to grow up around that mentality. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I have to imagine that that kind of manifests itself for you now, or that might be some kind of like feeling that you want to carry forward. Right? I've tried, but I am not, uh, <laughs> I feel like to garden and grow your own food, you have to like invest a little bit of time in the knowledge of like understanding how to do it. And I've done a shitty job of that. So I just like, <laughs> will plant a cucumber tr plant or a tomato plant and then not attend to it. And so it either just dies or it becomes this like overgrown monstrosity. But I will say living in Los Angeles is such a treat because we are very lucky to just have fruit trees everywhere. And like, for example, at my home, we have a huge avocado tree, like cool. enormous. I ate an avocado from my tree today and the lemon I put in my lemon water came from a basket in front of my neighbor's house. Oh, you know, so there is rules. like there is a yeah. really kind of special um vibe i hate to say it <laughs> you hate to hear it and I've, i hate to say it i know i fully embrace the word but you vibe. know what i mean like yeah, it no, is sure. and just walking by someone's house and there's just lemons growing in their front yard and that's just you know it, it it's such a, a weird thing to get to used to to get used to when you first move here but now i'm like oh just i want a lemon i'll just go get one from a tree like it's so <laughs> and it's it's and that is around the whole city. It's a really yeah. neat part of LA. No, absolutely. And I do think it weirdly speaks to kind of like where LA comes from or, or yeah. California, Southern California, where it was the, just this place where they were like, oh my, we can grow like so many oranges <laughs> and so many lemons. Is it, they won't stop growing. <laughs> this is incredible. And they don't. My uh, grandma lived here in, or a, a grandma lived here in, uh, but mine, lived here in the <laughs> 50s. And recently she's been like telling me a lot about it. I feel Aww. like there's a lot of just sort of like we've been relating in terms of that where she goes like, this is where I used to live with. It was me and six other gals and we used to live in such and such. And then wow. I was like, we had a conversation where I was like, I think that was that's Koreatown now. And then she like called me a couple days later and she was like, something's been keeping me up at night. And I was like, oh God, what is it? Is she dying? What's going on? And she was like, I looked it up. It's not. I looked up where Koreatown is. It's not in Korea. It wasn't in Koreatown. And I was just oh. like, oh, that's what was keeping you up. So anyway, all that to say, like, I do think a lot of that experience for her was, especially because she was coming from Arizona at the time and then moved back to Arizona. She, I think, still thinks of avocados as being like the Holy Grail. Like Tiny. when I was in, when I was in college, because I went away to college to New York and that's where we met at UCB. I, she would send me care packages from, you know, like from Arizona and was like the only person in my family that would, would do this. And it was so sweet, but I think she thought like, you probably don't have avocados out there. <laughs> so I would open up these just sort of like standard <coughs> FedEx, you know, like the boxes that you get at the, at the post office or whatever. And I would rip it open and it would inevitably, inevitably be like a thing of tortillas, a packet package of tortillas, a couple of cans of beans, and then a avocado that had just been completely obliterated oh by the two cans of beans yeah. rolling around yeah and but it was the thought was so sweet because she really when i would talk to her she would just say like and i know you guys don't get those out there so you gotta you gotta have avocados or whatever so there was just there's something so that we don't i think fully appreciate about living in this much oh, abundance no. i guess I, i'm curious were the tortillas and the beans specific to the region that you grew up in in arizona God, no Okay. No, 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 no. I mean, you could, it's like, it was like Rosarita refried beans and, and tortillas, but I think part of, and you know, you know, just prepackaged, you know, whatever, I can't think of the name of the brand name, but that you could get anywhere in America. But I guess that also speaks to the fact that like when she was growing up, that wasn't the case. Yeah. Like you didn't get that kind of food everywhere. Now that kind of food has become so mainstream, but it really was the sort of thing where it's like, oh, you're in Arizona, so you better have a flour tortilla, mm. the thing that we only have here. Um, so I do think that, she, I think she knows consciously, like you can get other stuff in other places, but I think for her, it's still sort of like, you're going to want this taste of 
the Southwest. Oh. And she was right. And I did. Yeah. Man, I ate the crap out of those beans, though. That was oh. the perfect college food of just like kind of get them. Not really going to make a whole thing with tortilla and beans because I don't have a kitchen. But then just like the second week of winter break when you're still at school, but nobody else is there mm-hmm. and you don't have any money. And you're mm-hmm. just like, time to figure out how to open this can of beans without a can opener. <laughs> jamming it with a pen <laughs> that sounds very good i had a friend one of my best friends from college her grandmother she's from texas and mm. her grandma grandmother used to send her pace salsa sure which you can get i but we were in maine and maybe you couldn't get it there but i will never forget my friend just eating this salsa it was so like so special to her even though to me it just looked like any other jar of salsa i think like in the 90s pace had like a big push maybe i don't know what it was but she used to just like (laughs) this was her salsa from texas and it was very like i mean i you know food is so amazing because the the flavors conjure up like nostalgia and memory you know i think that's like that again to circle back to your point it's like another powerful part about food that doesn't get as much we don't place as much value as we might like the vitamins in the food. Right. But those exactly. are heart vitamins. Do you see? <laughs> Love a vitamin. Vitamin heart shape. Yeah. Yes. They, they, they trigger good feelings and good memories. Yeah. Or maybe bad. I mean, Which, we're also bad. Right. Which again, and it feels weird to even say like every, not everything. It feels very like uh, capitalism with a capital C that everything has to have a distinct like value that we can place on it yeah. in terms of sort of like this is healthy for you or this will make you do more work or this will make you whatever. But I do think to put it in those terms, even just feeling good and having good memories from food. There is a sort of like neurological element of just like that is creating more well-being in your life. You literally mm. will be healthier on some on some level. You know what Certainly I mean? I like know. mental health. Yeah. yeah. Emotionally. So when you were, even if it's not so much in terms of the gardening, because I very much relate to that. I have like two herb plants on our front stoop that I am so proud of myself that I remember to water like every other day. That's and even really then good. they're not, you know, they do okay. They go back and forth. They're also not that useful. I feel like if I had thyme <laughs> or rosemary, it would be one thing, but I have mint and oregano, oh, which are somewhat yeah. useful. But oregano in particular, it's like you're pretty much only using it. It tastes so tomato saucy it that is. I pretty much only use it like for that. But are there other things or, you know, stuff that your grandparents used to make that you either still make or that you if you if you could just magically download the knowledge into your brain you would know how to make was the focaccia that for you they were not they did not make focaccia so my my dad's parents my grandma's italian my grandfather was not which is why my last name is spencer very un-italian last name but he kind of just like took on (laughs) the italian american vibe and my grandparents made this amazing vegetable lasagna. Ooh. They also made really, they're so funny. They were way ahead of their time. They made very <laughs> kind of, and, and again, I guess we've been talking about how this term is like a little problematic, but like healthy food. My grandmother had high cholesterol. Oh. So like they, they, also, they, they were always kind of making these really interesting meals where they were all very proud of the fact that like they weren't very... I don't know, you know, like the nutritional value was also very high. So they made this like beautiful kind of spinach lasagna that we would normally like eat on Thanksgiving before the turkey or Easter. And it's so good. And I, there was like a real lightness to it that I have never been able to replicate. And I, I don't, they didn't make it off of a recipe. It was just like in their brains. Oh, interesting. Um, so that's one that like I would love to do, but I feel like whenever I make lasagna, it's very like thick and heavy. And that just felt like fluff I don't have to fluffy is a strange word but there was it was just like light and delicious interesting and not too heavy why do you think that was I don't know I'm like so I I I was asking my brother if he had the recipe recently and he was like no there's no way we're ever gonna nail this one right um I bet I don't know though I bet I think you gotta like find out i don't know i feel like we can trace this back like there's got to be I other think, people well, yes my uncle is kind of like the holder of family food knowledge and he he actually Very has privileged position he really you know he's earned it he's he's kind of like like they do the feast of the seven fishes and like they and he and my aunt and my cousins are really all good cooks so he can have it um but he <laughs> did give me my grandfather's rebaked potato recipe which is like Ooh. another 
legendary family recipe on my Spencer side. What's the rebaked potato recipe? He would bake. And so far as you can say. Uh, oh, I can. We don't I want mean, to offend your uncle. No, we, okay. this is a, this is a specific, like we don't have a lot of family recipes, but this is one. And I do make it now on the holidays. He would bake potatoes, scoop them out. And then he would mush everything, you know, to, with like buttermilk, maybe sour cream, Parmesan, che- or maybe the buttermilk was in place of sour cream, Parmesan cheese, garlic powder, parsley, paprika. It's a, fa- it's a fascinating mix that I think only existed in my grandfather's head. And like, it tastes so good. And then you, and then he, he rebake, he bakes them again. Oh, wow. Which is why they're called rebakes in our family. Does he put them back in the potato skins? Put them back. Yes. He, ah, he's, after he makes this kind cool. of mashed potato-y, like savory mixture, he puts it back into the skins, bakes them again. So we would have that on Thanksgiving. So like, I never had mashed potatoes and gravy. It was always like lasagna, turkey, these rebaked potatoes, a really big green salad, just a, just a, like, I've never had a traditional Thanksgiving, a traditional as we think of like, you know, American Thanksgiving. I never right. had, had that. I never had like a yam casserole <laughs> or I just, all that shit did not exist in my world. But these rebaked potatoes did. Oh man. And they're so good. They're so, so good. Cool. And I do think like it, it's interesting. Cause I do think now it's like you got, and I've definitely fallen into this trap myself. Like uh, my wife and I are starting to be the Thanksgiving so among no. the people who make Thanksgiving, you know, in the family. And there's an impulse. I definitely have it to be like, I want to Google like best mashed potato yes. recipe, best, whatever blank. And then it sort of becomes this weird, like that's all great. And I think we've introduced some cool new things to the sort of like Thanksgiving lineup, but there is something to those sort of proprietary family things, especially when your family's kind of the only one out there. You got to keep it alive. Yeah. Like, it's, you know? Well, this year, I so I've had Christmas at my house and my <clears throat> brother and his wife come and my dad and my stepmom come. And this year, I ordered... Okay, this is a very... How do I explain this? There is a regional Italian-American stuffed bread that is specific to the New Haven, Connecticut area. It's a, it's, oh, wow. it's not, tell. it's not a stromboli. It doesn't have, you can have it with cheese. I sound a little nuts, but anyway, my grandparents would always get this what bread. What is it called? It's just called stuffed. In my family, it's called either broccoli bread or spinach bread, oh. but it's a stuffed bread that certain bakeries in like New Haven, East Haven, West Haven, Connecticut, that area you can get. And I, I started becoming obsessed with it because <clears throat> I was thinking about it. I hadn't had it since my grandparents were alive and they would have it at every holiday. And it often comes, like it's just drenched in olive oil with the garlic and then some, you can get it with sausage in it too, but not, it's just like a few chunks. And I reached out to some of my like East Coast Italian American friends, Jim Santangeli and Don Finelli, two uh, Italian American comedians. And I was like, do you know what this is? Did you ever have this? Because they're from Connecticut and Jersey. And they were like, I don't know. Which, and they're very, they're way sure, more extremely, Italian. Yes. Yeah, they are like the real deal. Jim is, and I don't think, I think this is probably public knowledge, so um, Italian American that an old job he used to have, I don't think he still does, was driving Sofia Coppola <laughs> around. Am I wrong? <laughs> Like that's yes, the the that most. Was Ita- he was he, uh, on the payroll of the most Ital- the Italian American dynasty. Yeah. Yes, and he like I think his family has like an outdoor brick pizza oven. Like, oh, isn't that right? I I don't know that, and they I'm a are little like, jealous that yeah. I was never invited to see it. But that is fantastic. No, so, yeah, they're so super I consulted Italian. Right, them, you consult them, and they had never heard of this bread. And at, and then I started googling bakeries, and I asked my uncle and my dad, and so I figured out where I could get this bread in. I think it's in West Haven, Connecticut. There was, there's a few bakeries. I called them and and I called all of them to see if they would ship. And one of them said they would. And so they shipped, I ordered like eight loaves of this bread for Christmas to surprise my dad and my brother with, which, and it was like a little anticlimactic. They were like, I was like, Oh, cool. But for me, it was just like, I, I wanted to have access to this thing that I used to really love as a growing up that, that felt very like, hyper specific to my family and where my dad is from um because new haven and the surrounding area is super uh, there was a ton of a ton of italian immigrants 
landed there. That's why New Haven has the best amazing pizza. I was going to say, I feel like yeah. I learned a few years ago when I started like vaguely trying to get into making pizza. Hasn't full, I have a pizza stone. It's full, we had a pizza Oscar party one time. It's going okay. We haven't, cool. we haven't made it in a while. But that New Haven, I was going to say, has a ton of very specific pizza styles, or at least a, a yes. couple of them. Like I think it's called like bar pizza or I something. There's like, just basically, is it like a deep di- there's something about it that's you like you know what i don't specific. even i never grew up eating it i ah, only yeah. know that it's that that it's like known for their pizza but so wild to me because you don't think of you know new hate you know you don't think no. of that as being such a huge italian center but it, it is, totally it is. is huge it's fascinating like somehow my that's where my all my family ended up after getting you know getting off at ellis island how are you guys keep are you keeping the feast of the seven fishes going? i've never done it and my grandparents didn't do it mm. i every christmas i toy with the idea sure and i like plan out like a f- so the feast of the seven fishes Please. if anyone's ever heard of it is on christmas eve in and i believe it's in a i don't know if it's an italian american tradition or if it also extends to italy it might just be i don't know um yeah, people make seven dishes, all fish dishes. And like eel is a big one, like a fried eel. There's another, there are a few that are like very um, kind of tried and true. You know, like if you, some, some people grew up with like their grandparents going to get eels from the fish market, like live eels and there'd be eels in the sink. This was not my, <laughs> not my experience, but in obsessively. A eel in a Santa hat. Yeah, just, yeah. And then you would, then someone would cut its head off and then you would eat it. But it's seven different fish dishes. So you can find any, you can find like BuzzFeed had a very basic, like it can be as simple as like anchovies and a pasta, or it can be as extreme as like, you know, many different fish, you know, real hardcore fish dishes. Yeah, my stepmom's family did, you know, did it always, they always did it every Christmas in some form or fashion. They're from Pittsburgh and they, um, uh, I believe growing up, she literally, they would go to, you know, her aunt's house yes. whatever, and they would have, you know, all of the different fishes and everything. And a lot of them, the families all get together and do all the which is cooking so cool. together. Yeah, it's which that, is amazing. Again, that lights up a very specific part of my brain. That sounds so cool. And then when she married my dad and then my grandma sort of came into the picture and became integrated into the holiday cooking thing for a while. And I think, and I have this part of my personality too, for sure. My dad was like, we got to do the fishes. We got to do it. We're doing the fishes. Um, and so for a while, and also my family already had a tradition that I have no idea where it came from of doing an oyster stew on Christmas oh, interesting. Eve. interesting. Which we're not on the East Coast. You're talking like Phoenix, Arizona. And then other parts of my family are from like Iowa and Minnesota. So oh, I wow. truly don't know where oyster stew what is an oyster stew? got in. So it's basically... It's a very specific recipe from, I mean, this one is that my dad would make from this book, Consider the Oyster, by this food writer named MFK Fisher, who kind of, in terms of overall, like, era and style was, it feels, but not necessarily ideology, it was like the, like, Ayn Rand of food. Oh she boy. was a very kind of, like, you know, intense woman who was, I think, also a very sort of like pioneering, like female food writer. Super cool name, right? MFK Fisher. Yeah. Um, she has a couple books, Consider the Oyster. And then there's another one. I, well, I can't remember the name. That's really good. I've read it. But um, so it comes from Consider the Oyster. And basically, it's just like heavy cream and then fresh oysters, like shucked yeah. or whatever. And then you use like the liquor from the oysters, like the juice from the oysters basically, and as well. And then I remember my dad telling me about it and he was like, he sent me the recipe one year because I was like, I gotta like get the oyster stew recipe. And he just put in the in the email, he was like, and then you put in paprika and you can't put in too much. He was like, it's, there's no such thing. It's It'll be fine. Like as much paprika as you can put in, it'll never be too much. And then uh, I made it for Haley and it was too much paprika. I used too much. <laughs> <laughs> I would love. How much did you think you put in? Um, like tablespoons? I was very early in my cooking career. I'm. I. It was probably yes. It was oh. probably multiple tablespoons oh my God, of that's paprika amazing. for two people. So it was like very <laughs> spiced, and also like 
It's just like that dry spice yeah. flavor where it wasn't super fresh, you know, it wasn't great. I It didn't go so far as to get like sludgy the way sometimes if you have a super spicy like ramen dish or something, there'll be like a pepper, uh-huh. you know, a spice sludge at the bottom, but it wasn't great. So is that kind of put me off it for a while. Is there a dairy, like is it a creamy stew? It is creamy. Are there potatoes I, in it? No, it's just, and this is where I feel like it has the potential to be extremely divisive. And I'll, I'll, we found out how divisive at one point, but um, a <laughs> it, it's literally just oysters, cream, and I don't even think there's like stock or anything. I think it's just like creamy oyster liquid with paprika in it and I and salt. And I think for a lot of people that sounds disgusting, and uh, maybe uh, it is, but I grew up with it, so I love it. it sounds like clam chowder to yes. me. Yeah. But then we ended up basically. So my dad died a few years ago and I like the first Christmas after he died I like thought about making it and then I was like I will only salt it with tears if I do that so I didn't I decided like let me give the oyster stew a couple years um but then other members of our family it like it came out that people were like obviously they were very sad that my dad died but they weren't exactly bummed that there wasn't the oyster (laughs) stew God. Where I was a li- felt very defensive, where I was like, it was great. And, <laughs> and now I'm a little bit like, as I'm saying it out loud, I'm like, I can understand why people might right. not like it. But it has a very specific association for me. Oh, I, I feel that way about all my Chris, all the Christmas meals that my mom used to make. And like every, every she year she made chicken marbella from the um, silver, pa- silver palette gourmet. Oh, what's it called? Wait. Please. Can I Google? Because I went into an insane wormhole and bought all the cookbooks. Silver... Palette? Why am I blanking? I think that's what it is. I think it's silver palette. If it's not, I'll I'll correct myself. Um, my mom used to make chicken marbella, which is a I believe it's the silver palette. It's like two ladies. They, they were very famous in the '80s, and they had a bunch. They had a bunch of very iconic like '80s recipes, and oh, chicken wow. marbella is one of them. We would have that. Um, she also made like a chocolate log, like a holiday log. Was it like a, bu- a bouche de Noel? Yes. Yeah, which I have never, like those are two, I like, I chicken marbella I've made. It's very easy. What, what's all going on with it? It's like, um, olives, prunes, uh, kind of this like vinegary marinade and you let it, um, you so- soak it, you let it marinate for a, like 24 hours. Oh, wow. You know, chicken breast, chicken thighs. Gotcha, okay. The whole shebang. We got like booze in there? Are we talking like wine or I vinegar? I don't. Or? I have to go back and look huh. at the recipe. I don't think so. It's oh, capers. Gotcha, okay. Prunes are the sure, big sure, thing sure. that stick out to me, which sound yeah. weird, but actually all the flavor, maybe like brown sugar. Interesting. It almost sounds, the prunes kind of makes me, it almost goes a little like Mediterranean mm. or like. It's very interesting, like green olives. Yeah, yes. Right. Well, you serve it with a rice or a potato dish. Um, but that, that to me, like, so uh, there's always this part of me that's like, we must eat what she cooked. And like, I, yeah. I don't know if it's like an attachment. Like I've never made the chocolate log. The chocolate log, the idea of it stresses me out, but I have fond memories of her making it and eat and it was fine. And also like, that's the thing. It was not like the greatest thing I'd ever eaten. But there's the, it's the emotional um, exactly. attachment. Yeah. Yes. Same I, with, the, we can make that log and the oyster stew. Just call it a meal. <laughs> like and the weirdest meal to ever exist. But I do think there's that like, that feeling of like one, I, like I must honor them. Yes. And do this thing that they yes. did. And then it's very weird, and you're like, but what if I made my own choices and traditions? Right. Well, because also you think about it. I don't know. It's like we can't all carry forward all the traditions because we got to bring our own stuff to it, and we kind of have to add our own stuff, and that's just kind of like what happens. I don't know. There's a reason that people don't eat the same things that we all ate a hundred years ago. Thank God. And also, like, you know, you're married. I'm married. Like, then our partner comes in and is like, hey, in my family, we did this. Yes. And it's like very different from what we, you know? Yes. and then when your kids grow up, for them, that will be kind of the gospel of this is what we, I this mean, is what we And it's only, did. it's going to be very odd. So what it, has it been like, speaking of, sorry, what you were saying. Oh, no, no, I'm done. I'm done with whatever my phrase was. What has it been like seeing your kids kind of relationship to food and their, also just their taste, like, develop, especially being the person who's primarily feeding them? It's really interesting what they, like, love and don't love. And like I have one of my kids doesn't like tomato sauce on her pasta. The other one does like tomato sauce. That that kid eats oatmeal for breakfast every day. The other one eats cereal. Like they're they're just kind of 
<clears throat> excuse me, like funny in particular. And then there are certain things they love, like rice and beans for dinner. Oh, yeah. Like they are ready to rock. <laughs> they love. Do you like that? I love rice. Right, and, like rice and beans to me is is delicious and like it's relatively easy to make. And I've just started learning how to cook from dried <gasps> beans. Yes. I've only done it a few times, but it is kind of, it's always like anytime I go to make something with beans, there's always that moment of going like, I should have started yesterday. Yes, I but when know. you remember, it's so good. Oh my, and also, good. have the you ever texture. tried Rancho Gordo beans? Only once I used them. So it's Rancho Gordo is this, it's like a, it's a literal, like they, it's a, it's a bean like company or it's, I think it's also a literal ranch. Like they grow. I think so. They grow the beans. beans. And they make, it's like an artisanal bean company, basically. So good. And I used them once to make a, um, I think they had cassoulet beans. Mm. And I used their cassoulet, to make cassoulet. It's like a very specific type of like French white bean. Yes. Um, And that was very good. So what kind of beans are you, what's your go-to rancho gordo? I've just started dipping a toe into the rancho gordo dried bean world. But they (laughs) have, what a world. It is a delicious world. They have something called the eye of the goat. It's so good. I, I I was like, very pagan. Lord, it does sound very pagan, doesn't it? Um, I was, you know, and I, I sound like I'm I'm the person I, I know that this has been a practice that people have been cooking this way for millions of, not millions, thousands of years. But when you have your own personal discovery of like, I finally soaked beans and they're amazing. Like it it's, feels like you're the first person to discover this new world. But it they just were so good. And the um, gravy or the sauce of the bean was so delicious. And then I was just eating them with everything. Like in with my eggs, like with a salad, just on it. Just the beans were phenomenal. And also circling back to my whole issues with restricted eating beans were another food that it was very hard for me to let myself eat again interesting i got very influenced i think by like whole 30 eating and paleo oh. eating and, and beans are like a no-go in that legumes are kind of a uh-uh in that world so it sounds like you were kind of operating for a long time which i think most of us are in one way or another in like there's a line in in the movie spinal tap where the michael mckeon character talks about his like meeting his like I think girlfriend or wife or whatever who's kind of like a Yoko Ono figure in the movie and he was talking about like before I met Janine I was just (laughs) assembling whatever little bits of spiritual wisdom happened to drift through my transom is how he puts it I think more or less and I think a lot of us are kind of doing that with a lot of different things like but food wisdom or food knowledge being one of them where it's sort of like you read this book and you kind of get into this sort of like diet or thing for a while and you kind of like pick up that one little thing from that one and whatever, before you know it, you've assembled this kind of a bunch of different Legos who, who knows if they fully like fit. Well, they all often, they all contradict each other, which is when I I kind of (laughs) began to feel, um, I don't want to use the word paralyzed, but like I began to feel like I couldn't make a decision on what to eat because I had all this conflicting information in my head. Yeah. And that was kind of when I like reached my, not rock bottom, but like my breaking point of my relationship, my past, my previous relationship with food and really understanding that I needed to make a change. And also, you know, something I think about having two children and two daughters is like, I want to model a really loving relationship to food. That is all these things like cooking and learning about things and trying new things and maybe not liking them. And, and just, so that's, that's something I really try to keep in mind when we eat together as a family. And, and actually our family is really good about eating together every night. That's awesome. That's a new thing. Like oh, the interesting. first five years of having children, it was just like, ah, like <laughs> everyone eating at different times and me eating like a rotisserie chicken over the sink. But in the past couple of years, both my children are in elementary school, so we we sit down to dinner at least like five times a week together. That's and awesome. also right now my husband's schedule is such that he's home at a reasonable time. Like nothing, it's all kind of working out that we can have dinner together. And That's it's really so cool. nice. And my family didn't really do that. Oh, interesting. Like my dad always kind of worked late. My mom would just like feed my brother and me at like the counter. I don't remember like all sitting around the table. Was she eating at the same time? I have zero recollection interesting I'm, my mom ate and right. my mom had a really like good relationship with food but i think she would just like eat at the kitchen counter yeah i mean I, like, I i do it is so interesting where there are these kind of like weird waves of things that happen where it's sort of like 
kids who grew up in a certain time or whatever when it was like white bread is the new thing yeah everyone's got to eat white bread because that's the most nutritious whatever and then you just look back and you go like wait we weren't that wasn't necessarily the optimal thing to be doing or I think about like you know children of the of the 80s where it was just sort of like everything is like fruit by the foot and we are just like super processed sugary insane whatever garbage where that is one thing that I often think about like cooking where I'm a little bit like you know we try to like eat healthy and and stuff like that and eat mostly plants and things like that but I also think it's like if you're making your own food somewhat and not literally from scratch like you're always breaking breaking your own bread or whatever but if you're like making meals that aren't just literally from a box like I feel like you're so far ahead of the game in terms of yeah but I do think fruit by the foot is so good (laughs) you had it recently I, I haven't my kid gets like occasionally gets it from this <gasps> ice cream truck that she nice. and like I'll get a bite of it. Yeah. And it's like be- and also <laughs> really like the classic fruit roll ups, yes. like not fruit leathers. Right. Fruit yes. roll ups are in, so good. And this is the thing is I feel like when you've had it growing up. I include myself here. It is always good to you. Like I feel yes. this way about McDonald's. Oh, like same. we had McDonald's like every Friday night or whatever growing up. We didn't have it all the time. It was a treat, but like it was a treat that we had every a Wednesday amount. in my house. Yeah. Nice. So now I have this thing in my head where I'm like, at the end of the day, you can show me any documentary you want to show me. <laughs> McDonald's is good. Yeah. And Haley, my wife, in no way has that. Her mom was extremely healthy. Her mom was kind of running what they were eating growing up. And so they just like never, never, never had fast food. And so when I, we were on a road trip and I was like, we should stop and get McDonald's. Cause that's normally what I do when I like drive to Phoenix or whatever. She was like, okay. <laughs> as she, as, as she tells it, actually, I like said that. And then she realized we were already in the drive through <laughs> <laughs> Like it was already in progress. And bottom line is she didn't like what she had gotten and then she started disassembling it to like try to make something that maybe she would like and that was really bad like whatever you do don't look under the hood no 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 on a quartzite arizona mcdonald's burger (laughs) but she started to and then it's just like i tried to tell her like i think you have to have developed a certain thing in your brain at a certain age that says like this is good and I still feel that way about a lot of the sort of like junk foodie stuff that we had growing oh, up oh god no part yes. of me can fully disavow it even though I know that it's bad you know and I came from a home where like we didn't have a lot of junk food like my mom actually was kind of you know, she, it was, she was like a you know hippie yuppie born in 1950s so like she was healthy-ish but like I still think about like honey honey grant honey smacks or do you like know sugar that? Smacks? Or yeah, she know that. Honey? No sugar. They're like these like yes. grains covered in like honey sugar. I think a frog is on. Yes, there. I still. When I got to college at my college, we just had like this m- big cafeteria with a cereal bar, where you could just get any cereal, and I so I would eat that. That's like the dream of college. Oh, it was in. It was amazing, and that that would be my like dessert. It would be like two bowls of cereal. Of all these sugar cereals that I had been denied as a child. And that one, like I passed it with my daughter in Target the other day. And I was just like, I want, I could eat that right now. I could eat like bowls and bowls of it. it was, was this so the oatmeal good. daughter? Was she like, I have no This was the cereal daughter. <laughs> we were buying her some cereal because she has to have, it's a whole, oatmeal daughter eats a bowl of oatmeal. With OD, shout out to OD. OD, my younger one. It's oat, oatmeal, brown sugar, and frozen blueberries for breakfast every day. It's very healthful. And then she runs seven miles. She does. She runs <laughs> up the Hollywood Hills and down. But that's a great, that's a, it is. Know. It's really, she's gotten very into it. It's just what she likes to eat. I don't, I don't that know. That also is such a nice kind of like, I, I feel like it's only recently that I've learned that you can like eat that kind of thing for breakfast. There was a while where I wasn't, just wasn't eating breakfast. And I was like, that's healthy. And then I realized like, no, I need something at yeah. the beginning of the day. And it's neat to have like, also to not just have like a banana, you know, like you can have yeah. like real, that just sounds good. That oatmeal just sounds well, so and like such a good start make, to the day. You can make oatmeal savory too. Like you could take a lot of the flavors from your fried rice and put it and make it an oatmeal. Can you talk about your savory oatmeal? Oh flow? yeah. Miso, miso paste, oatmeal, cilantro, sesame oil. I put an egg in there. I had savory, oh, nutritional yeast in my oatmeal. I, so I grew up eating salty oatmeal. 
Interesting. I, that might be, this is now the Puritan side of my family. No, do tell. This is my mom's side. Gotcha. The waspy New England. Clapboard house. Yes. Just like. Martini at 4 p.m. Pilgrim hat a on. A little bit like gotcha. marching in very old bean boots. <laughs> Honestly, that a is. Mudroom? Mudroom? Always a mudroom. <laughs> And there was always like at my aunt and uncle's house, like a goat with a bro- broken leg who'd been moved inside. And Spalding Gray is just there. It's no very like, <laughs> there's a lot of that. But so, And I mean, they also have a beautiful relationship with food. But my mom, I never had sh- sweet oatmeal. Again, I think I got to college and I was putting salt in my oatmeal and someone was like, what are you doing? I always put salt and butter in my oatmeal, which is how I still like it. So you and my wife Haley have to talk about savory oatmeal because she is all the way in on, <gasps> on it. She savory makes oatmeal. a mean savory oatmeal. Yes, Absolutely. it's yes. the best. She does the steel cut oats. It's like some, t- some days we'll be home like at the same time in the sort of like late morning-ish, whatever, especially if like one of us, one or more of us has just gotten back from working out or whatever. And she's like, I'm going to make a savory oatmeal. Do you want one? Mm. And it's just like, she makes such a good six minute egg. Sometimes if we have one and she has time, she'll do like a little caramelized, you know, onion or something oh, on there. Shallot. Yeah. Cilantro. If you're a cilantro eater. Ooh, I am big time. No, that's genius. Have you made kanji? No, but I have eaten it and I like it very much and I would love to learn how to make it. It's pretty, I don't want to generalize here. But I've made a just like very basic like chicken kanji where you basically just yeah. put a ton of chicken pieces in with like water and rice and just like let it go forever. Oh, also ginger. Speaking of mm. like you like just like chop up some ginger, put it in there. And then eventually after a while, you're going to like fish out the chicken bones after everything's kind of like dissolved and the rice breaks. And yeah, it's, so, it's so good. And then also what I think could be maybe be fun for kids is like I think a big part of kanji is like you can everybody can kind of pick their own toppings. Mm-hmm. And you can, oh, it's so, f- I've, uh, it's having made it, it's so easy to make at home, or at least this one is. Okay. Let me see if I can find it. I'll send it to you. I, I would love that. Cause I love, I, lo- I like a savory breakfast. Sweet, this would be, sweet yes, breakfast. totally. I mean, this could be also dinner. It could be any, yeah. it could be any time oh, of day. Oh yes. Well, I will like a savory bowl of porridge yes. of whatever porridge it is. Like a cream of wheat even with salt and butter. Mm, 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 mm. Have you ever had Japanese breakfast? Because I'm pretty sure no. a lot of Japanese folks are just having a miso soup and like a little yes. bit of rice for breakfast, which to me sounds like a dream. Is the dream. It's really interesting that Ameri- like kind of and when I say American, I'm specifically speaking to my own experience, which is a, I'm a white American person. Same. Like I feel like our breakfasts have always just been like sweet. Yeah. And a, a savory breakfast. I, I've never I've never been to Japan. I've never been to a Japanese restaurant for breakfast. I have had miso soup for breakfast, and actually this year I got into that. There you go. Very so you have. So there, yes. yeah, you've, yes. you've, you've, that's, that's. It's so warming and just filling, and I love like a little bit of tofu and scallion in there. Yes. So this is sort of circling back to the college of it all. This is something that I wanted to ask you specifically. True or false, Kate Spencer, you were or maybe are still, in fact, a fish fan. True. I'm going to see three shows this summer. Fantastic. They're playing in Mexico right now this <gasps> weekend, and I am sad I am not there. Why are you going to see them? Um, two, sh- Hopefully two nights in San Francisco, one night here in L.A. Gotcha. So reason I ask is, did you, in your history of seeing fish or other similar jam bands, ever have any experience food parking lot experiences? DC. Oh, my God. Yes. Do tell. I sold <gasps> garlic grilled cheeses in the lot on summer tour in 1999. I think there's there's a lot of like cuisine it's changed over the years I'm sure and I'm not like as frequent of a fish tour goer anymore now that I'm like a 40 year old mom but uh in the late 90s garlic grilled cheese was gr- like the best describe your show. garlic grilled cheese flow you I you we were cooking on a camp stove um me and my friend Teresa and we started you, you can get them on any like dead or fish lot or I'm sure whoever else drink cheese incident I don't know um but we started selling them because we had gotten a speeding ticket in Virginia on tour so we were like let's make some money pay off this ticket all you need is just white you want to have white bread you want to have the most American American cheese you can find because the melt yeah, it's just I also, um, I am, I love American cheese. Me too. And I love it. A grilled cheese, the only way to eat it is with American cheese. Yes. I cannot cheddar. <laughs> I can't with any other fancy, I fucking love American cheese and a grilled cheese. And then salted butter. 
And then garlic powder. I mean, if you wanted to really go for it, I'm sure you could make a nice garlic butter, but we would just, you just like put the bread on, you know, butter, bread, put some cheese in, sprinkle some garlic Ooh. salt in there or garlic powder. Yes. A garlic grilled cheese. It's like, and I like three slices of American cheese in there. Did you pay off the speeding ticket? I think we definitely, I don't recall if we actually paid it off. It was like $130 oh or it was gosh. pretty big for 1999. How much are the grilled cheeses going for? I think we sold them for a dollar. Great. You know, I think it was a deal. pretty, but it, you know, when all, maybe, maybe two, I'm trying to remember because it was 1999 when we were doing it for the most part. But yes, I love also like a really great burrito, veggie burritos you can get. I mean, people are very, um, the like capitalist community of a, fish or dead show parking lot is really amazing like people i um there's a real entrepreneurial spirit and like people are very hard working it's and really good at selling their goods and their wares and they will like they'll show like a lot of people will be out in the lot getting all the food ready while you're in the show so that when you come out they are there to feed you i mean it's it's truly amazing if you have never seen been in a parking lot for one of these shows sure poke fun but no truly it is a, an amazing microcosm of the world not that you're poking and fun the world but, at you know, its best. yes and pe- people tend to you know mock the fish culture right but it really is incredible yes i've never been into those bands in a big way but that culture is very fascinating to me yeah. in, the park, in the lot culture there was a guy that used to have a podcast this guy zach brooks used to have a podcast called food is the new rock where he would talk to musicians about food oh interesting or or vice versa. He would talk to like chefs about music and it was very, very good. I don't think it's still around, but he was a big, I believe a big fish fan and would always talk about these very specific egg rolls that he would have. Oh, yum. Like in the, uh, on the lot, you know. Some of the things you see people cooking out there to sell or just on their own is incredible. I mean like these full productions, really interesting food, like it's it it blows my mind every time I'm there, and people are have gotten even only more like creative and and smart about selling stuff. Best non your own garlic grilled cheese uh, thing you ever ate? I don't have like a specific one, but after you've like been, you know, a fish show requires a lot of energy because there's a lot of dancing, a lot of celebrating. So to leave a show at eleven o'clock at night somewhere in America. And just go out and get like, get yourself a grilled cheese and then also like a beer because you people are selling beers. You know, it's just, it's like the perfect meal. Oh man. It's so good. I do love a garlic element in a grilled cheese. I've gotten very into like making grilled cheese in a cast iron skillet mm. and then throwing in just a like, not even fully peeled, but if you just like break the peel of a clove of garlic and just like put it in the pan and then baste, uh, baste it. That sounds so good. Uh, take it take it I into will. your real cheese flow by all means at the at the lot you know should i get in frisco should i get back into break this, out the camp uh, stove yeah should i get back into this business <laughs> why not have your kids out there that feels very oh, that is very that feels very hippie culture to yeah me. they have not been yet Barefoot but children running around the oatmeal daughter the wants cheese. to see a fish show so i can bring the oatmeal feels daughter very yeah. oatmeal daughter, <laughs> oatmeal daughter. <laughs> the other one's like i'm gonna see so like Camila Cabela, Cab- you know, whoever, Ariana Grande. That's a big one. <laughs> Camila Cabela. I think that's her name. I know because I've worked on so many award shows and have had to tell so many people how to pronounce it mm-hmm. that it's, and watch me say it wrong now, Camila Cabello. Oh, Cabello. See, I'm butchered. Because, it. But I there's also know. a little bit of a, I think for non-Spanish speakers, both the first and the, the last name have a little bit of a like, you know, it's not your first not your first thought, you know what I mean? In like terms the of inflection. how exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, sweet. So I feel like, I feel like, well, I, I guess like this is again, one, as we kind of like wrap up here, something that I think pertains more to you and to your podcast forever 35. Like, is there, how do you either, whether it's you or whether it's somebody else that you maybe have talked to on the show or whatever, what are some examples of like you that you've seen of like people using food as like self care in a really healthy way? Because I do think for some people it's sort of like the idea of just like I had a bad day, I'm gonna eat a whole thing of ice cream, which obviously is like sometimes that's great, but other times it's like oh we can kind of have unhealthy relationships to it. Like how have you seen people, oh. yourself included, use it in like kind of a and again whatever healthy means? Whether uh, that's right, <laughs> right. I know a loaded word. Yes. I, I, there are a few people. Um, who really baking is very like calming to people and meditative, which I find very interesting because 
I, the way my my brain is like I have a very hard time following a recipe and following instructions um, or even just the idea of baking from memory or of your own confidence of just like I'll whip this thing together I, I just don't the science of baking is I still don't really get but I have we've had a few guests who um, and Jasmine Guillory is a person who's been on our podcast who's a really New York Times bestselling romance author who's amazing and she bakes for self-care and she also she has a wonderful newsletter where she includes some of her favorite recipes and I just love the idea that like to relieve stress you know like someone might go for a run but someone else might be like I'm gonna bake like a loaf of bread or some I'm gonna bake some cookies or a pie like a pie to me feels like a stressful like (laughs) oh my god I don't know how to make dough and I don't understand the like cutting the things so they become strips on top and I bought the wrong apples (laughs) but I just think that I do see how baking especially can be meditative. And I think that, and even like cooking a little bit, like when you have to make risotto and you always have to be stirring, like you can't ever go like look at your phone or whatever, because you've got to constantly be adding liquid and stirring like that to me, I feel like is a very, a nice way of soothing the mind. Do you like making risotto? I do. I wish more, I wish my kids would eat it, but maybe that's something I need to kind of revisit. Oh, interesting. Why do you, it seems so kid friendly to me, but then again, I don't have kids. You would fucking think, you would think (laughs) this is the, this is the nightmare of, I think that many parents face of like, oh, this seems like grilled cheese. My kids don't like grilled cheese. What? You know what I mean? And again, maybe it's because they're not being raised in the eighties, but huh. They don't want to eat grilled cheese where it's like, I could eat grilled cheese for every meal. Truly. So, um, they will come around one day on risotto and grilled cheese. And you will, and you will lead them. I will lead the way and then they will turn around <laughs> and make it for me. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Kate. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Good night. We did it. Wait. Guys, thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Stay for Dinner. Um, Thanks so much to Kate. That was an awesome conversation. If you enjoyed the show, please follow us at at Stay for Dinner Pod on Instagram, Twitter, uh, at Stay for Dinner. Um, And if you decide to cook along at home, please, please take a picture of what you make and hashtag it Stay for Dinner Pod. I would be thrilled to retweet it or repost it or what have you. And my theme song is July 4th, 2004 by the incredible singer-songwriter Jason Anderson. You can find that song, uh, that version of that song um, on Spotify on the EP So Long. And my interstitial music was by Advanced Bass, the amazing Owen Ashworth. Um, If you have any questions, comments, concerns, ideas, please email me at stayfordinnerpod at gmail.com. You can also follow me on uh, Twitter at DC Pearson, uh, on Instagram at D-E-E-C-E-E Pearson, uh, because I got on Instagram in 2019. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, um, that's it. Please uh, rate and subscribe to the podcast wherever you do such things. And we will talk to you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>